I would like to uh, take this time to thank each of you for coming to our eighth annual meeting. I think it's been a wonderful meeting, and we've had uh, some wonderful speakers, and we still have some more to go. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Steve Holditch, and I'm going to be the uh, president this coming year of TAMIST, and it's my distinct pleasure right now to introduce to you uh, Bobby Alford. He's a distinguished service professor at the Baylor College of Medicine, and he's been the chancellor at the Baylor College of Medicine from 2004 until September of 2010. So Bobby uh, was going to come up and introduce uh, Senator Hutchinson to you. Thank you, Dr. Holders. Um, it is a special privilege for me to introduce today's luncheon speaker, Senator Kay Bailey Hutchison. Since her election to the Senate in 1993, Texas and the nation have greatly benefited from her incomparable and tireless service. Senator Hutchison is the first woman to have uh, to be on the uh, Texas U uh, U.S. Senate. During her terms in the Senate, she has established a well-deserved reputation as one of the Senate's leading advocates for science, education, technology, and competitiveness. She has been a strong advocate for better health care for our veterans, and she's been a strong advocate for NASA and safe human space flight and safe human space exploration. It's been a pleasure for me to have the privilege of working with uh, Senator Hutchison on, on a number of things. Many regard the Senator as possibly the most powerful woman in the Senate today. She is the senior Republican on the Senate Committee on Commerce Service, uh, Science rather, and Transportation, and she serves also on the Appropriation Committee as well as two other Senate committees. During her tenure in the Senate, she has sponsored and co-sponsored numerous bills that have been enacted and have made a difference for her constituents and for the rest of the country as well. Two of these bills in recent years are worthy of note, the America Competes Act and the bill to award a congressional gold medal to Dr. Michael E. DeBakey. Yesterday, uh, Michael Brown commented during the program that it was Senator Hutchison's goal and inspiration as well as determination eight years ago to advance science, research, and education in Texas. That led to the, what we know today as the Academy of Medicine, Engineering, and Science of Texas, and uh, usually referred to as TAMIS. Having uh, been able to interact with her for, for a, a number of, okay, on a number of occasions, I'm very pleased to have this privilege, as I said today, to uh, introduce her. Um, I would like to uh, ask uh, the, uh, the, if you would join me in welcoming uh, Senator Hutchison uh, to the podium. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Bobby, and thank you for the efforts that you have made and so many people in this room have made uh, to really build something that will be a lasting treasure for Texas, and that is this organization. Um, I'll start by saying that I hated to miss the meat of the program because normally in the last eight years I have come for most of it and I've enjoyed listening to it, but uh, this year, of course, I was in Washington, and uh, so I just got in, but since I did just get in from Washington, I thought I would start my speech today by reading the Constitution. <laughs> well, let me just um, start. I don't want to give all the basics about the starting of TAMIST too much because most of you already know it and all of you who are members have heard it uh, so many times. I do want to say that 
it took so many different people to make this organization successful. And um, we couldn't have done it without our corporate sponsors, without our chancellors and presidents and heads of our medical schools who uh, really paid the way of their academy members uh, in the early days when we were just trying to live within a budget. Um, those of you who helped us raise now $10 million for the operational endowment and the ones who've served as president uh, year after year and building it. Um, uh, all of this together. But I do want to say uh, a special thank you to our Nobel laureates. Um, without, in fact, Michael Brown, who's just left, and uh, Dick Smalley uh, were the founding co-chairs, as we all know. And when we were having our summits um, in Washington for five years with our research experts and the federal government um, agencies that were doing research so that I could get the minds of Texas and the federal priorities together, um, the, the idea for TAMIST came about. And, and it was because I wanted to have a different atmosphere in Texas for our research institutions. And after all of the discussion, this is what I asked our scientists, our chancellors and presidents to do. And it was basically simple. It was first to create your own centers of excellence. Don't try to do what other people are doing. Don't try to be everything to everybody. Be the best in something and then let me help you through re federal research dollars, let me help you build on those centers of excellence. And then secondly, collaborate, don't compete. 10 years ago, if you had said, yes, all of our universities are gonna come together and they're gonna share what we've been doing and they're gonna sing Kumbaya and march off and do research together, we would have said, I don't think so because there was such a spirit of competition. But that didn't work anymore because our federal dollars, what I wanted to do was create the centers of excellence, put them together so that you have a better capability for the best research. And so then the question came up, well, but we don't really know what's going on in the other institutions. We don't know what research is being done in Dallas and Houston and San Antonio because we don't really know the other people in the field. So that was the beginning of TAMIST. And I have to say that the Nobel laureates are the ones who set the structure of TAMIST. I would have done it a totally different way. And fortunately, they, when they said, oh, you need to be the one who organizes all this, I said, no. For this group, it is the Nobel laureates who are the rock stars, not a politician. And so Michael Brown and Richard Smalley came together and then Robert Curl and so many of our other Nobel laureates came together and they set the structure which was totally different from what I would have thought as coming from my background. And the key is they wanted to have the protégés in the meetings, they wanted the protégés, the next generation of great science leaders to be included so that they would be the ones that would be sparked to do the next research projects that were going to uh, create what uh, is going to make life different in our country. And they're the ones, when Peter O'Donnell, and Carolyn, thank you so much, Carolyn Bacon, for being the catalyst for all of the Peter and Edith O'Donnell Foundation projects. When Peter O'Donnell said, you know, he, and he sat there through all the early meetings and he said, this is something that we need to do. And so he put the money behind it. He said, I want to give awards for the great research that's being done in Texas to promote it. It was the Nobel laureates who said, it can't go to any of us. In fact, it shouldn't even go to one of our members who's already an Academy member because we have already achieved so much. 
We need the new research to be the award winners. That's how we'll bring the great research minds to Texas. And that's exactly what they did. So you got to see last night the great next generation leaders and what they are doing and the encouragement that we are giving them with the very generous O'Donnell Awards. And of course, the fact that it's our Nobel Laureate Committee who picks the winners makes it even more prestigious. So I've had the reports from Lindsay Parham, who is my uh, chief of staff, who has been at the very beginning of TAMIS, I've had the reports every day on the different speeches and the programs, and, and clearly this is one of our great successful uh, meetings. But let me just tell you what has happened since we started TAMIS and we started with the two missions of collaborate, don't compete, and have your own centers of excellence so that we have the best in the different institutions in Texas. We have gone from sixth in the nation, states getting federal research dollars into our institutions of higher education. We were sixth when I went on the Appropriations Committee. Today, because of all of the efforts of the founders of this organization, we are third in the nation, only behind California and New York, and we are right on the heels of New York. We are nipping at their heels. They were at it longer, but we're moving faster. And that's what I'm so excited about, and that's why I want to bring in more of our great researchers and Nobel laureates to help us continue this uh, propelling of the research that is adding to the basis of our economy. So here are some examples of things that have happened because of our collaboration. Lone Star 4, our Texas supercomputer, it is the University of Texas at Austin, Texas Tech, Texas A&M, Dell, and Intel. And again, Peter O'Donnell started with the seed money for the supercomputing operations that were coming out of the University of Texas. And now with the industry partnerships and these, this consortia of our great research universities, we are going to be in the forefront of computer modeling for energy, biology, physics, cybersecurity, and on and on. This is something that was so good that the National Science Foundation gave us a $9 million grant for it. So, that's excellence, that's competing on the merits, that's not earmarks, that is because we showed that we could do it in the very best way and we met the test of peer review. The Center for Transportation and Electricity Convergence, UT Austin and Texas A&M, have partnered with several industry leaders, some of which uh, are in the room now, and again, the National Science Foundation has put in seven and a half million dollars to this consortium for this center. This center is going to study and recommend the best methods of integrating the power grid, new roadway networks, and infrastructure systems for serving growing electric car demands. Now, all of you know the practical reality of electric cars. They're great, but there are very few of them and they have very few places to get the, uh, the apparatus for the fuel and all the things that you have to have to do one, and it's kind of a hassle, but it's a, it's a great new thing. Well, what this organization, this center can do with automobile manufacturers, electric utilities, regulatory agencies are gonna be able to come in and see how we can make these work better and certainly have a more user-friendly way of operating. And obviously having batteries that can store electricity longer is part of that. Uh, so this is going to be a very important new generation of research. We started, when, when we started TAMIST and when I started this project of con collaboration, we started with what we called SPRING, which was a consortium for nanomaterials to make materials stronger, headed by Rice University. And here again is where Malcolm Gillis, the president of Rice at the time, who was one of the ones who was so excited about TAMIST, 
he agreed to let Tamas, let Rice take the lead with Bob Curl and Richard Smalley because they were the Nobel laureates in nanotechnology. And with their lead, we added uh, University of Texas at Austin, Arlington, Dallas. Uh, now we have the next generation of spring, which is called Contact. Rice University is still there, but now in the next generation, UT Arlington is going to take uh, a lead position. We've got UT Pan American, UT Brownsville, University of Houston. So we're putting together more into this consortium and who's buying in because it's so good? the United States Air Force, because they know that we're going to need those lighter, stronger materials for the airplanes of the future, and especially the drones, especially the UAVs, because the UAVs are now doing the surveillance in Afghanistan and on the border of Texas, among other places, and it's using these UAVs that saves lives because you don't have to have a pilot up there in a helicopter that uh, could be shot at. And so you've got UAVs, but they have to be light and strong to carry the camera equipment for surveillance. And also now they're shooting missiles out of UAVs. So it is the technology that was started with contact and spring that has now perfected the UAVs so that they would be able uh, to do this great job in our national security as well as our surveillance um, and not using pilots at all is so very important. So uh, we started making the nano projects for blackberries and little things, but it is so important. And I will tell you one other thing. I had a, a demonstration of the armor that our, our uh, men and women in Iraq and Afghanistan wear. And I've, I've been to Iraq and Afghanistan, and I can tell you it is pretty tough when you're wearing 90 pounds of weight and it's 120 degrees outside. But that's exactly what they had. But with the nano perfection that has come on the market just in the last five years, they have they have brought that weight down from 90 to 40 pounds. And, and it's just as strong, probably stronger, and it gives them a better comfort level, but also, of course, a more comfortable um, uh, situation in a 100 degree temperature. Uh, so there are so, so many exciting things that are happening in Texas because we have made this investment. Let me just mention a couple of others. University partnerships. The Metroplex Comprehensive Medical Imaging Center, where UT Southwestern Medical Center, UT Dallas, UT Arlington, are combining their efforts for cutting edge MRI scanning for the treatment of brain diseases, such as traumatic brain injury, which of course is one of the, the key areas of, uh, in our national defense um, of injury. Today, we are saving more lives, but the injuries are worse. Not only are people losing arms and legs, limbs, because of the IEDs that are uh, the road bombs that blow up, but also the brain injuries. So this is helping us with our military uh, and our veteran services, but it's also helping people because the traumatic brain injuries, of course, are in car wrecks and, and all kinds of other accidents. So uh, this is a consortium in North Texas that's doing a lot of work. It's doing cutting edge research that we know is going to make a difference for people who have Alzheimer's, people who've had these injuries, and we're gonna learn more about it. The National Center for Therapeutics Manufacturing, Texas A&M University and UTMD Anderson uh, Center are gonna combine their resources on the campus of A&M. This is going to open uh, later this year uh, and it's going to be to do the pharmaceutical manufacturing research and education. Uh, it's gonna be focused on therapeutics and vaccines for infectious diseases and cancers. Cancer vaccine research may be one of the highest areas of promising research that we have in America today. 
but this pharmaceutical manufacturing facility uh, that is going to speed up the treatment and work with the A&M animals that they have uh, will also be very important for uh, perfecting these vaccines and also selling them and giving more money back to the universities through royalties. And Michael DeBakey uh, did uh, this kind of effort with Texas A&M in the past, um, testing his heart pumps, and it's just a great way to have consortia. Let me just mention a couple of other things. Uh, the America Competes Act, Bobby mentioned, um, in 2007, after the Rising Above the Gathering Storm report that was done um, by the National Academies, Congress actually stepped up and did something good. We passed the America Competes Act with a three-year authorization of $33 billion, mostly to the National Science Foundation, but also to the Department of Education and the Department of Energy, the ARPA-E, um, especially um, at the research division at the Department of Energy, and the National Institute for Standards and Technology. Now, these, this three-year commitment ran out this year. Well, I'm going to tell you, this is a tough time for spending federal money. You know that it is. It's a very tough environment. I mean, we've got a $14 trillion debt, and we've got to responsibly address that debt by cutting spending. Well, several of us were working on the America Competes Act. Many of you in this room have said to me, oh, please, you've got to pass it again because we've got to keep that research uh, money flowing into especially the National Fo uh, Science Foundation and the Energy Department. And we passed the bill out of my committee, and we passed it out, but it, the authorization level was too high, and we had people on one end who were saying it's too much money, and on the other end saying, I'm going to stop anything that spends money right now. So we had both ends in the United States Senate, and I tried to pry that bill to the Senate floor for about four months. At the end, literally two days before Christmas Eve, we finally got the, the authorization level down but it's $44 billion, so it's still more than we had in the last three years. This is $44 billion that we got it down to for the next three years, so it will be an increase in the research spending. And we got the two people who were holding it up, and we said to both of them, Lamar Alexander is the hero here, and we sat down with those two, and we said, you cannot eat the seed corn of America. We have got to make the strategic investments to keep our economy going because we don't manufacture widgets in America. We don't manufacture, we don't even have steel plants anymore to speak of. We don't manufacture things, but we do innovate. And that's what fuels our economy. So if we're not gonna put the money into the research, the innovation will go away and we will be left in a flat economy or worse and they bought it. The two who were holding it up bought it, and in the last seconds, we got that bill through the United States Senate unanimously. <clears throat> and it went over to the House, and to their credit, they passed it on a bipartisan basis. Wasn't quite unanimous, but it was bipartisan, and it does show that when you make the right arguments, even Congress can understand it. <laughs> so, I guess I'm going to leave you with this. We cannot rest on our laureates. <laughs> That's right. We've got to continue to bring the next generation in. And that's why I love this organization so much. That's why we have put so much energy by so many people together to say this is the right thing for our state 
to be the leader in these very important areas. Part of that America Competes Act, I want to say, I don't know if, if Marianne Rankin is still here. Marianne, thank you. We also funded and put standards around the You Teach program that Marianne Rankin started at the University of Texas because one of the recommendations of the rising above the gathering storm was that if we're going to have the next generation of scientists, we can't start in college encouraging the kids to take the courses. We have to start in middle school at the very latest, middle and high school. And what the National Academy said is, you can't have the junior high football coach teaching chemistry and biology and expect the kids to think it's an exciting program. Now, I'm sure there are exceptions to this, but my middle school biology teacher was the junior high school football coach. So I speak from experience. And I didn't take biology in college. So I'm telling you that this hit home for me. The You Teach program is the best thing in the nation and was recognized by Congress in the America Competes Act to be the best standard, and that is to offer to our college students who are majoring in science, any kind of hard science, engineering, math, to also get through electives teacher certification so they can take through electives the, C the teacher certification. And what has happened is that those young students are now going into teaching. They're going into teaching in secondary and uh, primary and secondary schools. And the ones who are doing it are staying in. The longevity of the teachers who have majored in these courses are now teaching the kids in the middle school, which is the most important time to start getting them excited. And here again, our Nobel laureates are stepping up to the plate, and you see these robotics teams, these little kids in the t-shirts that are getting ready to compete back here in the Lego robotics, and every one of them has a Nobel laureate on their team. And that is the mission of this organization. If anything recognized uh, our mission, it is that. Because these kids back here, I don't know if you saw them, they were so cute and so excited. And I was talking to one of the darling boys, and I, he was talking like a PhD. And I said, what grade are you in? And he said, fifth grade. I said, oh my gosh, this is so exciting. And then, of course, I did ask Michael Brown, who was standing there, okay, so what were you doing at this age? And he said, playing baseball. <laughs> so we're doing something right. And what I'm here to say is thank you for your enthusiasm for participating. Those of you who are contributing, who are sponsors, those of you who are attending, those of you who are protégés, know how much you mean to us because you are our future. My last point I'm gonna make is that um, since we passed the act, I wanted to just make sure that everyone has the parameters that the National Science Foundation has, what they're asking you for, what they want to have research grant applications come in for with the America Competes money. And I've got one of these for each of you, John E2, raise your hand in the back. Okay, he's got them. Are they at the tables? Okay. Uh, so we've got the STEM education grants, the Marianne Rankin STEM education grants, and how you can uh, offer these to your students. The, uh, the way that the National Science Foundation is prioritizing, and also the Department of Energy does it a little different way. Uh, they do it by contracts, but you can compete for those. And just to give you a, a couple of bullet points, the NSF with the New America Competes Act will begin allowing universities to use 5% of their grant funding toward patent applications for inventions that are generated by the research. So we're doing some things that I think are addressing the issues of America. 
And I'm very excited about it, and I thank all of you for your participation and for carrying this forward. I know it's going to outlast all of us, and of course, that is my greatest wish. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I have been asked to present the last part of this program, and that is the O'Donnell Awards for the AP Teacher of the Year in Texas. Now, this is all part of getting the, the great teachers to inspire our students. And Peter O'Donnell, once again, and Edith, uh, stepped forward to give yet another award uh, for the teachers who are doing the great work of inspiring our students through AP courses, the Advanced Placement courses. And so I am now going to present uh, the O'Donnell AP Teacher Award. At Thursday's O'Donnell Awards for Achievements in Science, Medicine, and Engineering, we recognize the pioneering innovators. But we would be remiss if we didn't honor the educators who represent the critical bridge between academics and inspiration. The outstanding individuals who are being recognized this afternoon do not just teach. They challenge, they motivate, and inspire our future scientific leaders. We know that students who enroll in advanced placement programs in high school outperform their peers in math, science, and English. They are more competitive for college, they receive more scholarships and financial aid, and they tend to perform better. These public AP teachers not only have changed their students' lives, they have made remarkable contributions to the teaching profession. I want to ask this year's O'Donnell AP Award finalists, Dixie Ross, Nancy Scoggin, and Penny Smelser to join me on the stage along with Roman Harrington with the Communities Foundation of Texas. <clears throat> As they're coming up, I'm going to tell you a little bit about each of them, and then I will announce the award, uh, the one award winner who will ha make a few remarks. First, I'm going to introduce Dixie Ross, who is a University of Texas alum. Raise your hand, Dixie. She spent 21 of her 26 years in education devoted to teaching AP calculus. For the last eight years, she has chaired the top-ranked AP Calculus program at Pflugerville High School. Last year, Pflugerville's AP Calculus scores were among the 10 highest in the state. Dixie's passion for learning is evident in her tireless efforts to recruit more students to AP classes. She established a panel of students called the AP Ambassadors to ignite interest throughout the Pflugerville School District. Her successes extend beyond her own school district to the College Board, where she leads their summer institutes and has authored numerous articles. Congratulations, Dixie. Glad you're here. <laughs> Nancy Scoggin is a, Nancy, raise your hand, a graduate of the University of Southern Mississippi and boasts a 36-year teaching career. For the past 30 years, she has taught at Joshua High School in Joshua, Texas, and is currently the head director of bands, the director of fine arts, and the AP music theory teacher. Two out of the last three years, every single one of her AP music theory students have passed the AP exam. In addition to her achievements at Joshua High School, Nancy has also been a presenter at conferences, working with the College Board, and authored materials about her program. In February 2010, Nancy completed the AP Music Theory Guidebook, written for and published by Barron's Educational Publishers. Nancy, thank you for all your work. <laughs> Penny Smeltzer graduated from Western Michigan University and has been teaching for 31 years, including 14 years devoted to AP statistics. 
She currently teaches AP Statistics at Westwood High School in Round Rock ISD. As a result of her innovative leadership, Westwood High boasts one of the largest AP Statistics programs in the nation. Much of her success is attributed to her ability to make advanced mathematics both graspable and engaging. Penny skillfully incorporates real-world applications to the statistical problems her students are learning in the classroom. In addition to her work at Westwood High, Penny is passionate about mentoring new or struggling teachers. She has worked with Pasadena ISD to grow their AP program. Thank you for your work, and let's give all three of these outstanding teachers a hand. And now, do you go next, or do I announce the winner? You make the announcement. Okay. I will uh, announce the third place goes to Nancy Scoggin. Second place to Dixie Ross, and first place to Penny Smelser. Congratulations. And Penny, why don't you say a few words? Congratulations. Thank you so much. This is certainly a statistically significant day for me. <laughs> I'd like to thank the O'Donnell Foundation and the O'Donnells and Community Foundations of Texas for showing their appreciation from the real world to those of us who are teaching high school. And I'd also like to thank my principal, Rebecca Donald. It would be impossible to do great teaching without having a principal that can juggle so many balls in so many places and then get out of our way so that we can do what we do best and what we love to do. There's a lot of criticism about public education and education in high school, but I'm here to tell you that I've noticed, and it's been my experience, that the higher I raise the bar in my classroom, the higher the students go to meet it. And although I hear a lot of people worried about education from where I sit in my classroom, I'm not that worried because I'm seeing a lot of students that are really interested in inventing a lot of things. They, they now want to do things for others. We've gotten through the materialistic generation and now I'm finding students that want to help, they want to create, and they want to think. So I appreciate it and I think, wow, this is amazing. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Senator Hutchison, for your very uh, kind remarks, and, and also uh, thank you to Penny, Dixie, and uh, Nancy, uh, certainly all very deserving uh, candidates uh, for receiving the award this year. Uh, my name is Roman Harrington. I'm uh, Donor Services Director at Communities Foundation of Texas, and we uh, administer this program, which is really a largely collaborative venture. I was telling the people at our table that this is one of those kinds of programs that really warms your heart and everybody gets credit at the end of the day for, for playing their role. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't thank uh, Charlotte Carlisle with AP Strategies. Uh, AP Strategies did an invaluable, uh, had an invaluable role at the onset in being able to screen many of the applicants and then being able to ultimately get to the list of the finalists that we had uh, here today. Uh, this is a program which had it as, as its genesis three years ago when Morton Meyerson uh, came up with the idea of how can we help really recognize and celebrate the contributions of uh, AP teachers uh, throughout the state of Texas, but even more uh, than that, how can we help elevate the platform for having conversations about AP education and its role within uh, the classroom, knowing all of the benefits that then do occur as a result of that. And so going into that, there were two expressed goals with trying to be able to create this award. The first goal was uh, he wanted to uh, very much thank and honor uh, the contributions made by uh, Peter and Edith O'Donnell uh, and all of the work that they have been doing in uh, helping elevate the role of education and making strategic investments in education across the state. 
I know Carolyn Bacon uh, had to leave a little early, but thank you, Taylor, if you can certainly extend uh, uh, his appreciation to them. Uh, and the second goal was to help recognize uh, the importance and the contributions of AP uh, education. Uh, in order to do that, one of the steps that we have now taken is the formal creation of a dedicated website, which I understand is now live as about maybe 30, 45 minutes ago, which is uh, texasapteacherawards.org. Uh, the website will have uh, information related to education, AP education. It will have uh, information related to the awards program moving forward. But it will also have biographical and video profiles of the three candidates that you saw on the stage here today. Uh, I'd like to be able to share with you, uh, we have a video, which will be the video profile of this year's uh, 2010 O'Donnell Texas AP Teacher, AP Teacher Award recipient, winner, uh, Penny Smeltzer, and we should be showing that immediately. Thank you. <laughs> I'm Penny Smeltzer and I'm an AP Statistics teacher at Westwood High School. I've been teaching for over 30 years and loving every minute of it. When I was in second grade, I had Mrs. Kent and she was teaching a class that was half second grade and half third grade and I was one of the little second graders. And when I was supposed to be working, I'd watch her with the third graders and see how they just looked at her with her mouth open and she was so smart and I thought, if I could just be as smart as Mrs. Kent, it would be fantastic. When you want to start a new class, you have to rope the students in. So I advertised. It's all about advertising. So the more you get the word out and then make the class fun for the kids and make the class possible for the kids, they'll sign up. <laughs> Everybody uses statistics in their life. It's a data-driven world. If you get on the scale, you're using statistics. If you watch sports, you're using statistics. Students really like to learn about themselves more than anything else. So I listen to them on the way into class. I listen to them when they're in the halls. And I start every single class problem with something that's going on right now in their lives. I think you need to take students from wherever they are to as far as you can get them to go. And once you get them going, they start running instead of walking and really enjoy learning more and becoming very proficient at a skill. I love watching their faces. Sometimes you'll be looking across the classroom and you'll see someone kind of screw up their face and you can tell that they're not getting it. And later in class you can see the, oh, and then you know they've got it. I don't think there's any better feeling than that. I want them to do something completely different and surprising that will maybe save us all or entertain us all. One of the best parts of being a teacher is getting to work with the other teachers. So what makes a teacher good is spending time with other outstanding teachers in all the fields. It's really important to me that I get to learn as much as the students do. It's just kind of a win-win-win all the way around. I think anyone that is interested in teaching should give it a try. I can't solve the problems of the world and I don't know if wind power is better than coal, that's better than gas, that's better than solar power, but every year I'm sending out a few little messengers to go out there and figure out the things that, that's going to help us all. It's kind of fun to have taught long enough that now at my school there's actually two teachers that I had in class and because they were in class, they said, oh, Miss Smeltzer, you made it look like so much fun. I thought I wanted to come, and how cool is this? I get to teach right with you. I've still got a long way to go, and I'm not gonna stop doing this till I get it right. I could be 100 and still teaching. Very good. Uh, <clears throat> we have a, a couple more items to go through for the, to finish the day. Um, could I have the first slide, please? Um, <clears throat> I'd like to finish or start off uh, my remarks 
by looking at our Constitution and just reminding everyone what the vision of uh, Tamist has been is, and the board, of, the board of Directors worked on this for several years, is to secure the future <clears throat> of Texas as a national leader in medicine, engineering, and science. And we have some very definite mission statements, and uh, I think that uh, we need to always keep in mind what we're trying to do, uh, elevate the uh, national stature, reputation, and ranking of Texas in medicine, engineering, and science, promote collaboration, as the senator said, is very, very important uh, part of what we want to do in Tamist. We want to serve as an intellectual resource for the state of Texas and the uh, work we've done on education, the work we're going to do this year on energy, I think can be quite important. And uh, inspire and recognize future generations of Texas scientists, engineers. And that's what we've been so, it's, it's such a big part of this meeting, the O'Donnell Awards and the AP Teacher Awards, is to look at the younger generation and bring them along. Innovation is the title of this meeting. Innovation, integrity, and service is what we're all about. And, and I, I propose that innovation ought to be one of the key themes of every meeting we have from now on. It's, it's so important. And finally, what we're going to do in 2011 is uh, continue our efforts to provide forums for interaction. This meeting is a wonderful meeting. We had a, a terrific <clears throat> agenda, speakers, and attendance, and we hope to uh, continue that next year. Our meeting next year will be in Houston. We're going to have an energy summit. We're going to try to, be, to lay the groundwork for an energy plan for Texas. And what should we be doing in this state for the next 10 years to prepare ourselves for, for the energy uh, needs? And that's going to include a lot of things, including the environment and water, etc. We want to continue promoting excellence in the O'Donnell Awards. Uh, we want to get our message out. We have a tremendous uh, story to tell about Texas, and we talk to each other a lot, but I think we need to get out to the superintendents the, of all the ISDs uh, in Texas about what Tamist is and what we can do for them and the state, and to serve as an intellectual resource for state government. <laughs> So to finish up, I'm very honored to be the uh, TAMIS president for this year, and I look forward to working with uh, all of our members and all of our constituents. So at this time, one more thing I need to do is ask Dr. Sigaror to come up here and uh, welcome him and thank him for all he has done for this organization over the last year. Thank you very much for your leadership. It's been terrific. Do you want to say anything? I've, I've learned so much from this man, and uh, I'm going to keep leaning well, I'll on be, it. Well, I'll be real brief. Um, this has been an absolute joy for me uh, to be able to serve as president of TAMIS for this past year. And I've been inspired every day by uh, the board members and the members of TAMIS uh, that I've been able to work with to continue to make certain uh, that we advance science in this great state of Texas, uh, that we inspire the next generation of students to pursue uh, these important fields of STEM and to be our future faculty and our future leaders of this nation. And uh, it's just been a lot of fun. And also to personally thank Beth Henderson for her incredible leadership uh, as the director of TAMIS. Beth, it's been a privilege to work with you. Thank you. Thank you.